out. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a pleasure to have um, uh, representatives from my two universities, the University of Cape Town and the University of Salford here. Um, also somewhere there's an internet archaeologist uh, in the audience, which is great because I'm an archaeologist. And um, there's something nice about talking about the Finch report in the Wren room, isn't there? You know? <laughs> um, I'd also like to say that I, the repository support group uh, really plays a very important role in this uh, movement. And as uh, <clears throat> Bill said, um, 2012 has turned out, I think, rather unexpectedly to be quite an extraordinarily important year <clears throat> um, as far as open access is concerned. And what I wanted to do was to go through some of the current uh, developments and the state of the landscape and highlight some of the key policy decisions that will be made over the next couple of months, which will really, I think, determine whether this takes off in a way that is, continues to be beneficial or whether we're going to see um, some snagging in progress that we need to pay attention to. Um, I'm always slightly nervous talking ahead of Alma, and, but uh, she, she won't hesitate to correct me if, uh, if, if, if I get something wrong. Um, so let me go on to this. Um, my proposition uh, behind open access uh, is that it, it, it is inevitable. We sometimes lose sight of that in the cut and thrust of policy developments and debates, particularly when we get down to the detail of particular forms of licensing or, or particular arguments about embargo periods for journals. Um, but my, my, my start, started pr proposition is that in the digital world that we live in, uh, paywalls are simply not sustainable. And if we step back a little bit from that, of course, that's something the music industry has discovered. It's something that the film industry has discovered. And it's something anybody who's got a smart 15-year-old knows. Um, and that is that you can't protect them ultimately because you've got the spillover effects uh, that are our feature of forms of digital communication. So I think the real issue here is the length and nature of the transition, not whether it's going to happen or not. Uh, and that's the, the landscape we're navigating. The other key advance, I think, which is a driver that's crept up on us from behind, but I think is going to also drive this forward, are these quite extraordinary developments we've seen in automated text and data mining over the past couple of, uh, of, of, of years. And there's a whole other community here, which many of you will be aware of, uh, which is the community coming out of areas like computational biology that are simply saying, we can't get the science advances we need unless we have a barrier-free environment to search for data. And I've been completely blown away uh, by some of the things uh, that, 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 that current developments in text and data mining can actually do uh, with information. It's quite extraordinary, in fact, when you think about uh, uh, extracting numerical data uh, from textual sources with degrees of accuracy that can allow you to test uh, potential pharmaceutical developments in drug design, for example. So we're seeing that coming through from a community that's very different from the sort of community that's advocated traditionally for open access. So there's a bit of convergence going on here, which I think is very interesting. A key issue uh, uh, here for me, and, 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 and I'm very happy that we can, if we can uh, have, have, have discussion about this or questions about it, and, and I really would invite questions. I'm assuming, Bill, I've got about 10 minutes longer uh, than I thought I had. Um, um, uh, the, the, a key driving issue here, and which is, which is key to any sort of consensus that we're managing to develop in the Finch group, is that freedom of access is not access for free. Um, and it is a very important point. And of course, uh, if you want to get anybody from a commercial uh, shareholder benefit driven publisher through to a scholarly society on board with this, you've simply got to acknowledge that point. And I would hope that we're all well beyond the notion that simply because it's on the internet doesn't cost anything. And unless you put this in, uh, you uh, don't uh, get into the uh, possibilities of viable policy. And of course, I don't have to tell an audience like this that all scholarly communications have uh, some form of intermediary cost um, and that you've got to take that into account. The costs, of course, are fundamentally different from, pa from paper publishing, but they're nevertheless there. Um, and uh, again, to take quite a pragmatic view on this, for me, full open access, which you can call it what you like, you can call it a pure gold world, if you like, uh, will require uh, full and upfront APCs. Um, and that's the premise that, that, that we've been working on, because otherwise you don't meet the intermediary costs. And of course, if you have everybody publishing with full upfront APCs, then um, the distinction between green and gold simply becomes an anachronism. Um, 
And that's, that's my sense of the, of, the, of the direction we're going. And just as a sideline, by the way, um, there is extraordinary confusion uh, uh, about the use of the terms green and gold out there. And I wonder whether they're continuing to be that useful um, in steering these sorts of policy directions. Um, a, a, a third bullet point for me, which is also important, um, is that I really think it's important that APC levels remain unregulated. There's a tendency in policy development, uh, particularly in this country, to always seek some form of regulation. Uh, as a vice chancellor, I can tell you that the notion that we have a market um, in student fees uh, when both quantity and price are strictly controlled by government is one of the biggest fictions I've ever come across in my life because the notion of a market where both basic, ba basically both price and quantity are regulated is by definition not a market. And there's a tendency in these discussions to say, oh, well, somehow we've got to regulate APCs. Now, the reason for that is usually um, because the notion is that you've got to regulate the rapacious interests of publishers who people suspect will immediately pile on the fees if it's not regulated. I think actually quite the opposite will happen. If you don't regulate APCs, you're going to see lots of innovative people coming into the market and they will in fact position very expensive publishers um, actually out of the market. Because ultimately, of course, a journal only has reputation if reputable scientists choose to publish in it. Otherwise, it's got no intellectual capital. So if a journal like Nature, uh, and I'm not picking them out because I think that they will in fact go to very high APCs, of course they're not there at all at the moment really, if a journal like Nature were to, were to persist uh, in the face of the market at let's say charging 5,000 US dollars in APCs, um, what would happen is that the scientists who publish in Nature would actually establish a reputable alternative. Um, and we've got to have an unregulated environment, otherwise we're not going to get innovation and we're not going to get prices down. Um, and again, um, a final obvious point to an audience like this, but not necessarily obvious to everybody else, if you've got all scholarly publications with full and upfront APCs, um, you don't need restrictions after publication. So you actually get to full CCBY. Um, because, of course, why do you want to regulate? Um, if you're a publisher, you've taken your margin out beforehand in a, in a true market situation. It's available. Why not let everybody distribute it freely? And, and I think that, that, that's the sort of uh, a thing that all the creative industries are eventually going, to, going towards. Now, the, the music and film industries are finding it very difficult to get to that particular point. But that's what innovation's um, all, all about. Um, so some of the policy drivers uh, at the moment um, that are really, I think, making the running on this. Um, the precedent of the Wellcome Trust is more and more important um, in terms of, 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 of what happens for the simple reason that the Wellcome Trust has used its muscle uh, to show how this can be done. Now, people might disagree with certain aspects of, of, of the Wellcome Trust settlement around publications, and the Wellcome Trust itself would say that they haven't done enough uh, to ensure compliance by their grant holders for open access publication, and they're looking at that, so they're very upfront, up, upfront and open about it. But they have taken a very important principled position about the open access for the research that they fund, and that's increasingly being used as a stable benchmark in these policy environments. It helps us enormously because when people come back and say, well, you're in uncharted territory, you can't risk this, you can turn around and say, well, what does the Wellcome Trust say? And that's actually politically very valuable. Um, second key driver, Research Councils UK. Uh, many of you will be aware of this. Um, and that is uh, their, their emerging consensus uh, that there, are, there should be open access requirements for all publicly funded research. Remember, they only have jurisdiction over the research that they fund, but they can require uh, how it's published. And I'll come on to that in a minute um, because that is one of the key things over the next couple of months. Now, although there's been a lot of positive noise, we are not out of the woods yet on that one. Uh, then Hefke, the Higher Education Funding Council for England, it's very important uh, that we remember it's the only the funding council for England. It's not for Northern Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. Uh, so there are other funding councils. Um, but Hefke has given a preliminary indication that they are considering uh, requiring that all submissions in the 2020 Research Excellence Framework, in other words, the next one, after the current one, are actually open access uh, uh, at the point when the submission is made, which would probably be well caught. <laughs> which would probably be in 2019. They haven't made that position yet, and they haven't amplified what they mean by it. Um, 
uh, and there are a lot of issues about what they mean by it, but again, it's an imp important, important position. Turning now to the publishers, um, I found in the work that we've done that it's really important not to demonize uh, 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 publishers. I'm quite on for demonizing one or two publishers, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, we do use the term publishers rather broadly, uh, forgetting that it includes some very important non-profit publishers as well, and scholarly societies and all sorts of other people. Um, but there are important publishers initiatives, uh, and one of them is the current UK Public Library Initiative, which I know some people do, uh, 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 view with great sus suspicion, but it will be a part of the Finch Report, uh, and that is the proposal uh, that a consortium of publishers uh, provide open access uh, to all of their journals as long as they are accessed through a public library, um, on-site through a public library. Um, and that, that's, you'll immediately see um, that from a government minister's point of view, that's got a lot of traction. Um, and it's likely to be in there because of the, uh, the, of, 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 of the politics. Then you've got the Coalition Research and Innovation Policy, which I think is a really important document. And the really interesting stuff's towards the end. And it's, of course, the announcement uh, that the government on principle uh, wants to provide open access to publicly owned data sets. Um, potentially very important for research. Again, not 100% clear, because countering that, of course, you've got data protection regulation. You can't just let the NHS database be available to researchers without violating, violating data protection. So a lot of work to be done before open access to uh, um, uh, general data sets is, is, is home and dry. But again, I think it's a game changer as far as open access is concerned. And then the other policy driver is, well, Elsevier has done us the biggest favor of all. Um, and if it wasn't for Elsevier uh, having, in fact, spectacularly uh, launched the, I think, misappropriately called Academic Spring, uh, 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 in fact, getting um, 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 serious academics who are so serious that they don't normally know what day of the week it is, uh, so angry uh, that they won't publish in Elsevier, uh, did us all a huge favor. Um, uh, and combining that with, I think, 38% profit margin uh, in their last reported year was about the best thing that could happen for the open access movement. So thank you, Elsevier, for a major contribution. Um, so navigating this transition then, um, what, what the, the, the term that's coming out at the moment, and this is, remember this is all in, 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 in my framework of it's a transition, and the issue is how long is the transition. We're heading into what, what is really being described as a mixed economy. So we're not going to see any radical, immediate um, paradigm shift um, into full APCs because it's going to be a lengthy transition period uh, over which that is achieved. Not, not necessarily because it can't be done technically, but because of the complexities of funding it. Um, and we're seeing a mixed economy where we're going to get a combination, of, which we already have, of APCs, hybrid journal, and licensing arrangements, and that's going to persist uh, for some time in the transition. And we're going to get different national paces of, uh, 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 paces of change um, uh, within uh, different sorts of countries. Um, and um, one of the issues that, 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 that gets sticky here and constantly comes up in the debates about this um, is um, whether or not, uh, by, by leading on um, open access, British publicly funded research is giving away its property to the, to, to the rest of the world. Now, this is actually really a bit of a silly argument in one sense, because, of course, the whole point about publishing is to give the work away. That's how academic work works. You want citations in re return for distributing the work. Um, that's, that's what drives academic work. And, of course, anybody in the world can get access uh, to, to, to British research. The question is whether you have to pay for it or not via a license or a subscription. And the other reason why it tends to get, be, be, be a bit of a difficult argument is because you then get right back to the commercial publisher argument that they've got all these deals for the third world anyway um, and they're giving lots of it away. So it's a bit of a, of a, bit of a, of, of a cul-de-sac uh, when it comes to arguments, but it is a political reality. It also gets tied up with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a fair degree of hubris, um, which maybe I'm just individually oversensitized to having spent a lot of time working in South Africa. And that is sort of, um, it's like an almost jubilee feeling. You know, it's Britain's God-given role in leading the world on innovation. So there's a bit in there that says, Britain has to lead on this because it's our national duty uh, to lead on open innovation. 
uh, which I think for everybody else across the world who's also working hard at that, that's a little bit offensive um, because uh, what does it feel like if you've been pushing for this in, in, in Europe across some of the consortia that, that Alma works with all the time? Um, so, and it's also counterbalanced, of course, by pretty big doses of self-interest uh, in this sense. But, but I think this is actually a pace of change issue because if you go back to the fundamental principle, why on earth would, I mean, it's, all, it's, it's actually all ultimately about China. There's this big threat. Somehow the Chinese are going to put up paywalls and they're going to charge us all for their research, but they're going to exploit our open access research. But you see, if you go back to the basic principles, why would China be any more interested or capable of maintaining paywalls for academic research than any other country? I mean, first of all, the technology is their technology. They have enough difficulty with their security surfaces in maintaining it. And they haven't even taken on the academic community. But why would they want to anyway? Because they want Chinese science to be recognized in the rest of the world. That's the whole point about it. Um, and of course, we're seeing, as, as Bill said, very important parallel developments in the US. So why would the US, why would we lead where the US lagged in terms of research developments? You say, Universities like Harvard been making this point repeatedly, very important developments. But it is a, you've got to watch out for it, for it's, it, it, it's, it's a little bit of the politics of this, and it really needs clarity of thought to allow that argument to, to, to get out of hand. The big frontier at the moment uh, in the transition um, is uh, the argument about publishers' embargo periods. This is, if you like, the new battle line in this. And what I think has happened is that most commercial publishers have accepted uh, APCs and, and full open access as an inevitability. But what they're trying to do is to work out business models in this transition to try and predict what their margins need to be in quite a complicated combination of some full upfront APCs and the combination of licensing and how you work that out in business models. And a lot of way that's being expressed is the embargo period. Now the embargo period is obviously important um, because in the transition period, let's, let's just run the embargo period argument via what will happen if research councils require open access for published research. Um, researchers in discipline X um, who don't happen to have available prestige fully open access journals with full upfront APCs because there isn't one in their field will be obliged to publish open access in order to have their research recognised either by their research councils or in the 2020 REF. So they're going to have to publish in a journal which could still be a subscription journal, a complete subscription journal with license. Now, in order to do that, to get it legitimately recognized, the embargo period is crucial. Um, the publishers argue that uh, the, the research council is heading towards an ideal of a six month embargo in that situation as maximum, recognizing that 12 months to start off with. Um, the publishers are saying that's not the half life. Uh, of the readership. Um, and they're actually saying you, 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 what, what, what our licensing tells us is in fact that we need to have embargo periods of 18 months or two years uh, because if we don't have that we actually lose the subscription income because it gets given away for nothing. Now I think a lot of this is eventually going to be resolved by good empirical data uh, and needs to be tested that way because there's a lot at the moment is simply based uh, on, um, uh, on an anecdote um, rather than any systematic understanding of that. And there is some of that data beginning to emerge now. Um, but that's the battle that I think the research councils are going to be facing. And that's one of the things that needs to be watched. Um, another negotiating issue is that um, when you think about it, <clears throat> if the research councils establish the principle that um, uh, all publicly funded research must be published in open access, they're going to have to fund the APCs, and they're going to have to fund it through the research allocations. Now, that's, the Wellcome Trust does that very successfully at the moment, and it does it by giving a block, a block grant uh, to people who receive Wellcome Trust grants. But the reason why that works for them is because the vast majority of their money goes into very few universities in quite constrained fields, so it's comparatively easy to do. And one of the things that the research councils have been struggling with is how to get the equivalent mechanism for a far broader uh, span of research. And the idea that's emerging here is the notion of requiring universities to have institutional publication funds. Uh, and the idea there is that through a formula yet to be decided, a proportion of the research money that's allocated, and it's to be quite a small proportion because when you look at it, um, it you know, it's certainly under 2% of research costs actually go into publication. But the idea is through a mechanism yet to be decided, 
funding institutions will receive essentially small block grants from the research councils, which they must put into um, an institutional publication fund, and that is used within the universities uh, for all open access publication. Now, that's not without snags. First of all, universities are very different in terms of their type. Uh, secondly, of course, the university, and you will know this in terms of repositories, uh, must also deal uh, with um, uh, the costs uh, of um, APCs for publications that might not be uh, submitted as part of that grant or as part of the REF. So, for example, in a future REF, do you fund, you, you'll get funding for that for your three-star and four-star equivalent journal publications, but you won't for your one- and two-star publications, and how are you going to navigate that? And then the other internal issue, which is, which, which is that, that, that in, a, in, a, in a proper world, uh, what should happen is as subscription and licensing charges go down and as APCs go up, then all university libraries should run to their vice chancellors and say, I want to surrender 15% of my budget so that you can put it in the institutional publication fund. And I look forward to that day. <laughs> um, so there's some issues around how this actually is going to work as we get over the transition. Um, another issue, of course, is there's no more money. Um, so when we have these discussions and when you talk with Hefke and Biz, at a point of, of, of frequency which is approximately every four and a half minutes, uh, you will be reminded there's no new money and there isn't going to be a, some for a decade because the wheels have fallen off the economy and we're in a terrible situation. So you can't deal with this transition as you would if there was more money by putting money in to help with the transition. So it's got to be done. Now that's making a number of people very, very nervous, understandably so. Um, large research intensive universities are understandably nervous about this um, because, of course, it does mean potentially that there could be less money for primary research because of those uh, friction things that I've talked about. Um, then there, are, there is collateral damage. There's always collateral damage in these sorts of paradigm shifts. Um, one which we've just simply not given enough attention to anywhere, including in the Finch group, are the scholarly monographs, and particularly in the humanities. I don't have to tell you there's a whole other crisis in monograph publication as university presses aren't able to do the traditional thing of publishing the brilliant PhD thesis for the academic who's starting on their careers. Um, that's becoming very difficult. We've got to get more thinking about that. I mean, my own view about that is that, is, is, is that universities are going to have to end up being their own open access publishers on monographs, putting in place the mechanisms for scholarly review, and getting them out on a print-on-demand basis in some sort of way of a consortium. And I, I, there have been a number of interesting developments about that, some of them in Australia. Um, but, 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 but we're not, at the moment, paying enough attention to that. This has been focused overwhelmingly on the medical sciences and the hard-end sciences, which is fine, because if you don't tackle that problem, you don't tackle the system. Um, learned societies are going to get caught in the pinch um, because learned societies use their journals under license uh, publication to generate revenues that they then use to pay for other activities. So we pay a premium on a lot of scholarly, uh, learned societies journals, uh, and that money is then used uh, for a variety of other purposes. Now, it's very difficult to separate that um, from commercial publishing because commercial publishers rightly say, well, that's the equivalent of a shareholder benefit, but you're choosing to invest it back into that community. And learned societies will feel a squeeze in this transition. Um, and the other group, which, 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 which is getting almost no attention at all, but I do keep saying it, is independent researchers. And these are people who are doing really important work, but they actually don't have a formal institutional affiliation. So they will not get access to a source of, uh, of institutional publication funds because they won't be a member of the community. No university is going to ch charitably fund an independent researcher. And a lot of those independent researchers aren't necessarily going to want to affiliate to universities in ways to get access to that. So we don't really know the size of that collateral, collateral damage effect yet uh, because I don't think that people in that position are, are at the moment sufficiently aware of what some of these implications might be. But it could be a serious loss to the research environment, particularly in some disciplines uh, where, this, uh, where this happens. And I'm thinking, again, for instance, of the humanities, um, of very smart, uh, hourly paid people who might have a job at three or four universities and who are going to end, to doing, end up doing that for four or five years. They're doing really good work. They're wanting to get the results of their PhD out there. 
in scholarly articles. They've got to do it to break into their career, but because they've not got a primary affiliation to every institution, everybody turns around and says, you can't get access to our institutional publication fund. Research councils say, get access to an institutional publication fund, and they're out in the cold. So that's a collateral damage issue that I think we need to pay attention to. Implications for repositories. Uh, um, I'm talking to the converted here. Um, these are obviously issues. They're all, they're, 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 I think they're largely met. Um, but obviously interoperability is essential. Uh, we can't get into a situation where we get new roadblocks. And, and I just get obsessed with issues of metadata here. Um, because if we're going to get full searchability, we've got to get that. A lot of that's in place already, but it's important to flag it um, because we don't want to get more friction into the system. There's a certain sort of argument which I don't personally fully understand about whether we should have disciplinary-based repositories versus institutional repositories. It seems to be an issue for some people. Um, I don't personally see why. Um, it's kind of like let a thousand repositories bloom as far as I'm concerned. I mean, if there is a need for them, let's have them. Um, but it is something that's being discussed. Um, but what we are looking for, I think, is, is convergence to what is essentially a single borderless virtual library um, where you're going to go in through these routes and get access to the stuff. And wouldn't that be wonderful? So your students at a university essentially don't have to be subscribed into a consortium catalog or an institutional catalog because it doesn't matter anymore. I think that has very, very, implica very, very interesting implications uh, for people uh, like many of you who work in this environment. Um, so other issues at the bottom of that slide there. Um, again, what we're looking at, I think, is a convergence between open access publication and open data. Uh, because, of course, uh, what happens, and you'll know this because a lot of repositories do this already, is that when you're moving towards full open access, um, and you've got a very important paper, it's a natural development to hyperlink the data sources to that so that people get access to that data in an open way. That is very desirable. It's, again, not straightforward and easy, and there are quite a lot of issues, privacy issues, data protection issues, uh, public domain uh, uh, issues. Uh, of course, uh, uh, um, you know, the leader to watch on this in terms of innovation is somebody like Google, because essentially they're doing it already, but they're commercializing all of that sort of information. Um, I think the grey literature distinction becomes meaningless. Um, what probably becomes uh, essential is quality control, which is already there. I'm intrigued that you've got a discussion later on today uh, about open access peer review, because I think the peer review system also comes under uh, a degree of interesting uh, spotlight in this situation, because, of course, some form of what we call peer review is going to be essential for sorting out quality. And we all know this. I mean, when we use search engines... You know, we can get 500 hits. Our problem is not getting the hits. It's working out what's good and what's not good uh, through them. So the quality control remains crucial. Um, and again, I've mentioned earlier that I think universities and university consortia will move towards self-publishing scholarly e-books uh, because we haven't tackled this issue uh, of uh, specialist monographs. Some milestones to watch. Um, the Finch Group report... Uh, we uh, expect a final draft of that uh, at the end of this weekend. Um, long public holidays have their values. Um, uh, and uh, the moment target of that is to uh, uh, publish that in mid-June. I think this is entirely up to ministerial schedules. It's a matter of uh, which minister is going to announce it, where and how it fits in with that. But the report will be ready within a couple of weeks. Now, what the report will do is that it will... Um, 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 set in motion a string of subsequent events because, of course, the Finch Group hasn't got any standing to rule on open access as far as the research councils or HEFG are concerned. So two subsequent very important decisions are which way the research councils jump, uh, whether or not uh, they do go uh, with their professional recommendations, remembering, of course, that the professionals making the recommendations don't ultimately make the governance decisions, uh, with um, uh, all uh, uh, funded uh, research being OA with a maximum 12-month embargo and full CCBY licenses. Now, that's the, that's the line. And the next key milestone is whether that actually is enacted by the research councils. And then the third issue, which I've mentioned, is whether the HEFKE board um, goes for all 2020 submissions to be OA in principle. Now, all of those decisions are scheduled to happen in June or July at the moment. Um, so you're going to get that stuff there. Um, and I think if that, if that, if that all happens, 
um, then there's going to be quite a significant increased interest in literally all forms of institutional repositories. So that's all I had um, by sketching out the landscape. And it would probably be most useful if I use the remaining, what, 15 minutes? 15? Yeah, 10, yeah, 15 that we've got? Um, to try and address any questions uh, that anybody um, might have.